Brands, agencies, and individuals want to create content that trends, wins customers, and goes viral. We all want to create messaging that gets shared by many and spreads the word about a cause or product that we are passionate about. How do some brands do it positively, influencing sales, winning customers, and even awards? Mike Sharman, the founder of the multi-award winning Retro Viral, joins me in this episode to unpack the thinking behind brand messaging that goes viral, wins awards, and customers. We have some of the finest stories ever created, not just in South Africa, but across the continent. They've created numerous award-winning viral campaigns for brands. You may have seen their work for Creepy Crawly. My creepy teacher that we created as a response to my octopus teacher. Checker 6060. South Africa's largest grocery delivery app. Nando's, Russell Hobbs, and countless others. We don't tell advertising, we tell stories. He's also the co-founder of other ventures, including influencer marketing platform Webfluential, Retroactive, and MatchKit. We talk about his latest best-selling book, Brandalism. Effectively, Brandalism is an anti-advertising movement. We're also giving away three signed copies of Brandalism by Mike Sharman. Anytime I write something, I want to encourage people to see inside the belly of the beast. This is The Lead Creative. Welcome to the Lead Creative Podcast, where we talk to creative industry leaders, influencers, and brands. We discuss the strategies that influence brand thinking and shape industries. Thought leaders and heads of agencies let us in on some of their thinking and insights. I'm your host, Monge Simtati. Enjoy the show, and please share and subscribe. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Gizzi, thanks for such a glowing introduction. Jeez, I think that that's an entire podcast on itself. Over the years, with influencer marketing seeing unprecedented growth, um, promoted content making its way onto our timelines, and other variables, Mike, that have um, pushed stories onto the public's consciousness, how do you define viral content today, given all of these changes? I saw a great quote when I was talking at the New Generation uh, Trends event, and someone tweeted, they said, we don't tell advertising, we tell stories. And I think that's ultimately the crux of all of this. I think the explosion of the, the stream team, whether it be Netflix, Disney+, Plus, Apple TV+, Plus, etc., ultimately the growth of these platforms and the explosion thereof is that we are looking for remarkable stories we can relate to that are true to us, they resonate with who we are as various target markets. And the characters within those stories, they aren't perfect. I think that's what we as audiences are looking for. We're not looking for advertising retail messages. We're looking for branded content that we can see ourselves starring in to emotionally connect with those brands and play along. Like we, It's time for, for the hard sell to stop. It's time for the storytelling to commence. That's 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 a very interesting um, outlook on it because I suppose, I mean, looking at a lot of the work that you guys have done, especially in recent times, and we'll get into it, it is a little bit of that um, imperfection that comes in, that humanness, that, that almost lack of um, high Hollywood-style production values. You know, I think there's... Um basically both sides of the of the coin really i think there's the high production side of the coin where it feels like the branded content is an actual netflix production but then there's also the proliferation of platforms such as tiktok and in lockdown we've seen that anybody can become a viral sensation and i think that with tiktok has come lower production values and the opportunity to edit on the fly edit on the mobile and then get your piece of content out there with a less restricted algorithm for global adoption and global appeal that's the yeah again um a very interesting i think a very interesting um, finding and and way of of looking at it because again you have been doing this for a long time and you and your team have evolved over the years, but how do you know that a piece of communication will go viral? Uh, I think you've answered your own question there. I think that ultimately, you know, when you've been doing this for so long, there's a real gut feel around something that just feels right. And nowadays, it's more important than ever to speed 
to, to move at the speed of relevance. If you have the ability to capitalize on a global water cooler moment. And what I mean by that is now even in South Africa, we are watching shows premiere the same time as the US, as the Far East, as the Antipodean markets. And it's for the first time in human history where we all get to gather around this digital water cooler, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, etc., and comment on pop culture as it breaks across the globe simultaneously. So there's there's that side of things, being relevant and being able to move fast. It's also about being able to work with clients who trust you and have a level of bravery and uh, who are willing to embrace the fear of what the result could be. And I think ultimately, those are two things that have been incredibly important for our success over the last couple of years. Interesting. Um, how relevant is virality in a time when trending content includes advertising with big budgets behind it that is that pushes itself onto our timelines? Yeah, you know, I think now more than ever, it's not necessarily about the paid media, big budget side of things. I think ultimately, you know, we like to wear the predominantly earned media hat. And what that means is, you know, if, if it's a piece of content that even journalists or the primetime news channel is wanting to cover because it touches a, it pulls a heartstring or it gives you a little bit of a tickle in the funny bone, like those are things that we ultimately think about first before we start building the production side of things. If the media are going to cover it, they are the original influencers. And this is something that will then gain legs by being distributed through mainstream news. Obviously, having your various tactics of distribution, whether it be influencers, paid media, um, your own channels, etc., those are still all critically important. And now more than ever, the integrated part of integrated marketing comes is the thing that will determine your success or failure. So a lot of what I'm getting there is that um, relevance is no longer measured necessarily by what we, you know, by, by what's in the news, but it's measured a lot in and around by the human story that becomes that that can become the news that can make it onto the news rather than what's on the news coming to the people yeah i mean as human beings our eyes are naturally attracted to other humans other faces so any form of product placement is better suited to being the cameo in a human story rather than just being the actual focal point. Case in point is my creepy teacher that we created for Creepy Crawly as a response to my octopus teacher, creating that inanimate object and bringing it to life in an animate space. Like that ultimately led to a more successful conversion rate because now we're telling a human interest piece with the co-star being the product. And I think that's the kind of stuff that brands need to strive towards. How does your product become a sidekick or the co-star or the cameo in a human interest piece. Yeah, yeah. And I think let's talk about, in fact, let's talk about my creepy teacher because that's that was going to be uh, my next question to you anyway. And it's uh, you've uh, very serendipitously segued to it nicely there. Um, so looking back, what would you say made my creepy teacher so globally successful? Because it wasn't just talked about locally. It didn't just win awards, which it did, but it also got a lot of talkability and a lot of interest on a global level. What, what made it that? What took it there? I think when I first saw the show, it was very specific and it was quite niche from a Cape Town storytelling perspective. You know, not everybody has access to the ocean to be able to go and just escape the reality and the hardships of the real world by going to swim in the ocean with a, a sea creature. And I think that there was a lot of fly on the wall interest pieces within that greater narrative, the unexplored bottom of the ocean, what exists there, the man and animal kind of symbiosis and juxtapositions within that. And for me, it helped having conversations with the brand already. We we created a few successful campaigns with Creepy Crawly over the years. We'd been having a conversation about doing an execution around the Paralympics and a successful South African Paralympian in particular. The Olympic Games and the Paralympics were placed on hold due to the global pandemic. And they served up a real opportunity to say, what kind of product could we juxtapose as an alternative to an octopus? 
And there was just something so sea creature like and magical about that creepy crawly integration that the you mentioned the word serendipitous and mm. serendipitously the world presented an opportunity for us to create a spoof that used the creepy crawly as the device and as that co-star, which worked out perfectly. And once again, gut feel, but also testing the material off our team. We have a very diverse, eclectic mix of, of individuals that work at Retroviral, different backgrounds, shapes, sizes, colors, creeds. Um, and off the back of that test case and testing it off individuals within the agency, we realized that we were at the right cusp of time and relevance and mass adoption and viewership to be able to give it a crack and go live with it. And off the back of those results, it snowballed. And like you say, within days, there were commentators in Australia, Mexico, South America, so many people talking about this product. Once again, the fact that it is a South African invention that is ubiquitous and is available globally also helped because people from all corners, four corners of the globe know what a creepy crawly is. How well did it translate to, to sales over that, over that period? Yeah, I think what's been really interesting is looking at the data that I think for the next six of the seven months, every month was up year on year. And remember, we were in the middle of a pandemic. So it wasn't like that the figures and the base numbers were low. Um, it also led to an increase in requests from buyers, because ultimately, Creepy Crawly still is a B2B brand. You need the, the buyers, the retailers to be excited about a product to bring in those shipments so that they can then drive it to the end users at the C of B2C level. And off the back of that, it was estimated that uh, sales increased by 20% year on year, which you know, at the start of the summer season, like Andy Rice said, perfect timing, perfect opportunity to capitalize on those people looking to replace their existing models or even those South Africans who are looking at setting up their pool for the first time. Now, when we looked at the research, South Africa as a market, we are the sixth largest private pool market in the world. That's an interesting fun fact for the day there, Mongezi. If you're enjoying The Lead Creative, please share this episode with your network and hit follow or subscribe. Enjoy the show. Very interesting, very interesting. Um, Mike, just to turn things a little bit, um, go in a, a different direction, um, it can be debated that some brands and ideas are easy to make exciting and to uh, make them, to make those ideas generate conversations around, um, around them, around the, 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 the idea and the concept itself, right? I know you've worked with everyone from pharmacy, ph pharmacies to fast food brands, um, banks, and everybody between. Does every brand have the ability to go viral? That's a great question. I think that the short answer is yes. And I always use the example of a white paper. A white paper on paper doesn't sound like the most sexy brand opportunity to go viral. But I'll give you a real world example of a PwC digital outlook report that uh, the management consultants deliver once a year or once every f a couple of years, depending on the data and the research. And for me in our industry, like that is the perfect example of insight and intellect that goes viral amongst the marketing and digital community, not just in South Africa, but across the African continent, because there's such great research around what's happening from a nuanced perspective in Nigeria, in Tanzania, in Kenya, South Africa. And the beautiful thing about that research is that you get to finally see how important it is to have a deep understanding of nuance across the continent because no two markets are the same. And for me, that is hugely valuable in terms of the insight and value that that delivers to us as marketers. So once again, I think depending on your target market, whether it be a video, a press release, a white paper, you have the ability to make all industries and all verticals go viral where virality for me is always about the right mix of eyeballs and some form of a conversion some form of transaction whether that's downloads whether that's signups whether that's the passing on of your email address or your whatsapp number or an actual commercial transaction in the form of sales but ultimately we're in this business to build leads build interest emotionally connect with the audience and have some form of transaction because otherwise we're not delivering the value for our money. 
One of the questions that came up at your book launch, uh, which we were a couple of weeks ago, uh, was this idea that um, in the B2B sense, in most instances, it tends to be quite serious and viral content tends to, by its very nature, be be entertaining. Um, and there are some brands that shy away from being sort of um, entertaining or having that sort of entertainment value to their content. What would you say to those kinds of brands that find themselves to be serious? I mean, you just mentioned PwC and PwC, of course, do serious, serious, you know, heavy mental lifting (laughs) with their work. Um, Whereas, you know, and Nando's, on the other hand, can be, can be, can be um, sort of entertaining because they play in that space. So in these two extremes, the one one would say it's easier if you're working with a certain type of brand rather than when you're working in, a, in another. What's your advice or what would you say to that sort of thinking? Yeah, I'd say that the insight really determines where the opportunities are for storytelling and the subsequent virality. So I've seen some of the best content and best storytelling and narratives come out of the most highbrow and serious brands with very affluent subject matter, long-term investing, Alan Gray, Coronation. Those brands in particular have been some of the finest at their style of storytelling over the years. I mean, Coronation has this beautiful piece of a gentleman who plants a tree every day in a specific swamp region and he's building, he's planting the trees in order to create more O2 opportunities for the environment to thrive. And that analogy was used from the importance of taking your time, investing wisely in your objectives and your outputs within your life. And even though it's not using money as the storytelling, it's a great way to showcase what patience and perseverance leading to pathways of prosperity and how that impacts you in your actual personal life. I get you. I get you. So, so it's, 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 it's very much about a, uh, having a deep understanding of a human insight that can be weaved into storytelling exactly. rather than what type of brand you are or how serious you consider yourself to be as a brand. Of course. And, you know, we have some of the finest stories ever created, not just in South Africa, but across the continent. And I think if we can really tap into the understanding of what those stories are, how we create visuals of people and groups that then resonate with our target audience or potential customers, that goes a long way in really getting that customer to see themselves in your brand's shoes or see themselves with your brand as their aid in terms of their own personal growth and development. So I think it's an exciting space, and I think not enough people are really spending enough time thinking, what are people wanting to watch? How are people engaging with TikTok? How are people engaging with the stream team of Netflix, Disney Plus, and co? And I think that out there, more and more opportunities to create branded content pieces that feel like films and don't just feel like flippant advertising. In your book, Mike, um, which, by the way, I really enjoyed uh, reading, and I'm going back to some chapters there. Um, um, in the book, um, Brandalism, you persuade brands to cannibalize what they created to give way to something new. Um, can you unpack what you mean by that? Yeah, what's interesting is the researcher on the book proves that you know the average age of an S&P 500 company nowadays is less than 18 years old, whereas just three or four decades ago, those companies were 50, 60 years old. So it took a lot longer to reach your maturity and your prime as a business. Nowadays, there's growths and uh, stumbles a lot quicker than at any other time in history. So if you don't continue to reinvent you will die. It's an inevitability. You know, some of the brands we thought we would never see the end of, they've come crashing down over the last few years. And it's not just the impact of COVID. It's just the fact that they haven't adapted to the modern world. Effectively, brandalism is an anti-advertising movement. And it's the thought process around what can you cannibalize within your existing legacy projects in order to move yourself forward. So I always love the example of Zuckerberg when he decided that mobile was the way forward. And, and that was the bet 
to be had. So what he did was he started telling his teams that you shouldn't come and present on PowerPoint decks. You should come and present for a mobile interface. And people who arrived in the boardroom or in the office to present on a laptop, those quickly and hastily were thrown out of the top floor of buildings at uh, one Facebook way. And it proved that it was important to look at what competitors were doing, what the snaps of the world, what the TikToks of the world, what the, the Instagrams and WhatsApp, which eventually became part of the Facebook meta environment. But ultimately, there are times when you have to acquire, there are times when you have to destroy, and there are times when you have to cannibalize your own self in order to move forward so that you still have relevance and sustenance within the market that you operate in. Great points. Uh, great points on that. And 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 it's it's it's. Um, I mean, for you know, brand leads, it can be uh, quite scary and 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 terrifying, especially big brands where the reporting structure is 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 uh, so huge, and and there are many moving parts. Yeah, I think that's the thing, right? Is that in so many large corporations, processes have been built to ensure that there is structure and that there is safety and that certain things don't go out to the public without having gone through the various channels. The problem with that is that a lot of times you can miss tactical opportunities because your behemoth of an organization is slow, too slow to adapt. Where we do get excited with the large brands is when they have structures in place to be tactical and to be streamlined in the decision-making process. So that's where we've been fortunate enough to work with the likes of Checkers uh, on their 6060 product in particular, which is now South Africa's largest grocery delivery app. And they can create missions in the app. They can run campaigns. And most recently, once again, we looked at pop culture and the proliferation of a story called the Tinder Swindler. And we looked at an opportunity to create a story that mirrored what the brand was doing on the mission side of the app. On the app, they mm. created a don't get swindled mission. And yeah. off the back of that, they had subjects called Peter Hurt. So like the movie, it referenced the injuries of the bodyguard. You could purchase Dettol and Elastoplast and various other products to help you if you have an injury. They had things like my enemies are after me. And within that space, you could buy energy drinks and uh, other products to keep you awake. Billionaires Club, the champagnes, yeah. the sparkling wines, all that kind of thing. And what really resonated off the back of that was that users found it hilarious that they were being very tactical and topical around a piece of content that so many people were speaking about once again around that digital water cooler. So we suggested to them that they move quickly and create a spoof around the Simon Levi of character because we had a production partner, Glenn Beatham yeah. Pamp, who's a comedian. He looked like the swindler, and it was a great opportunity to hear the inverted commas Simon Levi's side of the story, which once again, 4.7 million views on TikTok organically in a matter of days, conversation on various platforms, news channels, radio digital, etc. Once again, the brand dominated the news cycle. And I think as you can see, there's a real trend and there's a real synergy between being fast and being culturally relevant and having your finger on that pulse. And it does, it takes trust both ways between brands and uh, agency partners to execute at those speeds and craft levels at which we are. If you're enjoying The Lead Creative, please share this episode with your network and hit follow or subscribe. Enjoy the show. I want to, I think I want to, I want to come back to the book. Um, but before we do, I think you, you mentioned something else there that, that I want to sort of uh, zoom in on. And it's this idea of um, trust and trusting your agency partner, especially to move quickly and move with speed, which is what you did for both um, in both the Checkers 6060 campaign as well as with my, my creepy teacher. In instances where you are building that trust, how does how well can you still create trending or viral content? Can you still do it? Or does speed matter? Speed matters, but you can be way too early. So I think that's what's important is about bouncing those ideas off different collaborative partners. So in our agency, we have a WhatsApp group where we bounce ideas 
we check in and see like is this something that's being spoken about at a mainstream level a lot of times your trending topics on platforms such as twitter provide insight into when a lot of people are talking about one thing so with tinder swindler you could see on the trending topics there were thousands and thousands of tweets about it because so many people were watching it when it premiered and when it debuted so there's a lot of markers a lot of drivers you can use your social listening tools your orm products you can look at those trending topics like I said, but ultimately it's about having your team's insight and preparedness to be ready to tackle any tactical and topical opportunities. That was, you know, once the playground really for just brands like Nando's, but now there are opportunities that exist for brands, whether you are retail, FMCG, B2B, etc. So I just, um, I feel that if you listen or if you look in the right places of data segmentation, you'll always be able to uncover opportunities relevant for your verticals and your segments. You, you highlight in the book, Mike, the, the, these, you know, the, these two spoofs, um, you know, the, my creepy teacher, which is of course, um, this spoof of, um, my octopus teacher and the checker 6060 campaign, which is of course, this a spoof of, uh, twin, Tinder, which is of course this proof of Tinder Swindler. Um, what is the value in brands leveraging this model particularly? Because this is a, I mean, this is, uh, this becomes an important part in the book itself. I remember, I mean, reading that and talk and you talking about it. And this talks precisely to this cannibalization that you referred to. So why is spoof such a relevant tactic? Yeah, what, what is, not, not, not necessarily spoofs, but this, you know, f- this kind of model of um, taking something that's in the mainstream that people are talking about and finding a way to storify it. Why is that valuable for brands? So I think the relevance to brands being able to tap into topical moments is because social media was designed for human engagement and human interaction. Social media was never designed for brands to create pages and say, hey, I'm a brand, come talk with me, because Mm -hmm. it's a very Mm -hmm. foreign and forced relationship. It feels like someone who's been uninvited or not even invited to a party that you're having. So what being able to tap into a topical moment allows is a device, a foil or a vehicle for brands to participate and be involved in the conversation in a much more inclusive manner where they feel that they belong and they are not disparate or separated from the human experience. If brands play in the human experience space, they are likely to be more welcomed by their potential audience as opposed to disregarded or clicked away from when that uh, that skip in five seconds message disappears. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So advertising should in very many ways mirror life and life mirror advertising in a way that makes um, conversation flow almost seamlessly between people and brands. You know, you know, we talk about life imitating art or art imitating life. And ultimately, mm-hmm. life is the common denominator. So if you fit naturally and authentically within life, there's a greater chance for success for your brand. Right. So, Mike, just to put you on the spot a bit now um, about vandalism and um, put across an unfair question, because I know you put a lot of work and time and investment into this book, and I can tell when I read it, um, but just to come up with this unfair question, what was your favorite chapter to write in the book? I think that, you know, my favorite chapter to write was really around the stuff that I was so personally invested in. I think most of those stories, I have some level of personal investment, but I think the one was really around the Biogen journey with my best mate Hobbo, where we went on this journey for him to go from never having run a five kilometer race to completing a half Ironman. I think because 
that was effectively the campaign that launched our sports business, Retroactive. And also there was so much riding on it from a credibility point of view and from a completion point of view, because we didn't actually know if he was going to be able to complete that race. And I think in most instances, like I said, it's not arrogance, but it's confidence in having done this for so many years now. You have a gut feel on what you are able to execute, even if you don't know all the nuts and bolts and the details of what achieving that looks like at the start of the pitch. You know that you're able to deliver on that. When you have these variables that you can't control, it makes it a lot more tense in knowing whether you're going to able be able to deliver on that or not. So for me also, I am, um, you know, I trained with Hobo and I did the race too, so that I could also be accountable for the success of the campaign. And I think for me, that was a great one to tell that story. It also gave me a lot of uh, retrospective moments and reliving that idea. Uh, I had the privilege of being invited to do a TEDx talk in Twani. And for me, it's it's one of those campaigns that's had a real life impact on, on many levels. And it was one that I was incredibly emotionally connected with. Which was your favorite? My favorite was uh, chapter four. It was uh, the chapter uh, chapter about manifesto, not purpose. Um, and I think awesome. that is such an important um such an important thing that i'd like us to discuss it because because of course brands stick to their purpose their vision their this their that and um i mean i come across brands wanting to do strategy and things like that and and the, this idea of a manifesto behind themselves and behind their campaign always is can be jarring for them at times because there, there's a there's a there's a, a tried and tested way that we do this as brand X or brand A or brand B. Can you share what that means, what manifest or not purpose means and why it's important and how leading brands are using this, one brands that are using it and how brands can use it? My favorite new tagline is that I'm a Simon Sinek cynic because so many corporates have picked up find your why, and they've gone on this mission to find their why and their purpose, and they've had workshops around this specific subject matter. And for me, I find like your purpose or your why is very one-dimensional, and I think that it prevents you from vacillating between where you're at in the moment versus where you need to evolve to become as a business that has the opportunity to survive. And for me, the manifesto goes back to like a greater kind of collaborative space, uh, at our retroviral offices, we've got our shapes and our letters cut out on our wall, which details our manifesto. And the manifesto is effectively a, um, it's a prose that talks to our beliefs, our insights, our oxygen, really, why we exist. And it's so much deeper than just the why and the purpose, because there's something within those letters that are relevant to anybody who's walked through the door. So, you know, our manifesto here talks specifically about how we are the non-conventional agency. We were the kids that, you know, had insecurities, but we found our calling and the thing that we are flipping great at, which is comms. And off the back of that, you know, we, um, we elevate brands, we rationally drive interest in them, we emotionally connect people with them, we see ourselves as viral scientists. So there's a whole host of messaging within that. And of all the people that sit outside in the open plan office space, there's a little bit of something that each of them has brought to that manifesto. They all got the opportunity to comment on it, to add their own thoughts. And it's something that has been built together. I think when you look at the side of things from a purpose perspective, the purpose can be very personal to the leaders or the founders, and it might not necessarily resonate to the team as a whole. For me, that manifesto is something that should be co-written with the greater team so that everyone feels like they are co-invested in the vision and the success of the business. How often does it change and can you have a manifesto for for and around, say, a campaign or an idea that you want to drive as a business at any given point? I ask this at, uh, off the back of, um, again, my creepy teacher and the Checker 6060 campaign, which are both very new 
in looking at the legacy of the brands and where those two brands come from, because those brands became staples um, in the South African context, um, as well as, I mean, with Kripikoli globally as well. In fact, both of them, right? So, so th- this new way, this infusion of communication that you have brought in with these two campaigns cha- fundamentally changes what these brands now stand for or who they are seen to be in the marketplace does a does 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 that is that affected by a manifesto is it does a manifesto change to to include that how often do you revisit it well i think you know i think just for the clarification like the retro viral manifesto is for us as a creative agency to come up with creative sure. ideas for the brands that we work on so those mm-hmm. campaigns they aren't necessarily going to fundamentally shift the brands that we are working with or delivering for from their Absolutely. views and their positioning it's not for them to be changed i mean each of those brands could have their own manifestos based on where they'd like to take their businesses so i think that's one part of the conversation i think the mm-hmm. other thing is just how quickly these change i think Change is based on your own evolution and you wanting to move or pivot. So it possibly could uh, take the retroviral manifesto, revisit it now, and you know we could talk about the moving at the speed of relevance and adding some additional lines from some of the most successful campaigns we've rolled out over the last two years. So I don't think that there's a specific timeline that those have to live for. I think if somebody yeah. wanted to come and create a new line and add it to the wall, you know we could workshop that and groupthink that, and ultimately we've got some space on our walls to make some space for those letters and and put them right up there and i think that's the important thing is like you need to create safe spaces that whether you are the leader or the junior can put up your hand and you can contribute to the brainstorm whether it be internal or whether it be external facing for a campaign or a client if you're enjoying the lead creative please share this episode with your network and hit follow or subscribe enjoy the show if there's one thing that you want people to take away from the book, what would that one thing be? For me, I think that the most important thing is that anytime I write something, I want to encourage people to see inside the belly of the beast. That starting your own business, whether it's a creative business, whether it's creating a new division with an existing corporate, or even just going out and creating a blue collar solution to something that will help commuters and people getting to work in the morning such as the, uh, the lady who sells Amaguinia or the guy who does shoe shining at OR Tambo or you know, the next plumber or electrician to add value to a neighborhood or a suburb of people. I think ultimately we need to create better mentorship opportunities because we have such a depleted leadership structure to show people that anything is possible and to use uniquely South African examples to say that, hey, you don't have to send people to Mars to be successful. Like you can be the best plumber in your neighborhood. And that's also successful because you're putting food on your kid's table, you're being a good dad, and you're being a good example of what a leader is. We don't have enough examples of really good leaders in the public domain anymore. We have crooked politicians who steal the headlines and who do a lot of wrong stuff. We are the good people out there that are setting good examples being good parents, being good leaders of communities, and actually taking back accountability and the relationships that are important to them. So ultimately, that's what I'd like people to take out is like anything's possible, whether you want to start the smallest thing or the greatest empire, you all have opportunities to do that. And each of us has our own thing and our own skill and our own specialness. Thank you, Mike. Um, your insights always um, extremely um, valuable, and uh, yeah, thank you for making the time to chat with us uh, today. I got a lot out of that, and I'm sure that anybody listening will get a lot out of it. I think one of the biggest things that I take away from that is that um, advertising, advertising and communication mirror life, and and you know they mirror life and life mirrors them in very many ways and life is the common denominator uh, where those are concerned and that you know to remain relevant you need to find human stories or weave yourself naturally into human stories in spite of what's happening at the time because we are all always interested in those human stories and find real human insights to move uh, to move forward and of course um cannibalize what you've built as a brand to then to build something new or give away 
to something new. Thank you very much, Mike. Love it. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to The Lead Creative. Did you get one insight that's worth sharing from this episode? Please share it with your network or your friends. Pop me some of your ideas and innovative finds on Twitter, on at Mongesi. This podcast is available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, Google, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also find me on mongesi.com. <laughs>